Hello, my name is Michael Jones. I've been practicing mental health counseling for approximately 17 years now and also been doing telemental health counseling for the past eight years. Uh, I am a counselor educator at Messiah College and I wanted to provide this crash course for students who are in master's level programs and also PhD level programs as well who are not yet licensed to do counseling. Uh, the purpose of this course is to give you some basic things that you need to do if you're planning on getting into telemental health counseling, especially if you are in a field experience at this time. And so I hope to, uh, that the time that we spend together today will be beneficial to you and helping you to know the things that you need to do to get ready to get into this practice. So we just have a few learning objectives that we want to go over today or some learning points that we're going to hit. Uh, first, we're going to talk about some of the current conflict that's going on between our laws, our ethics, the liability insurance we carry, and also third-party payers. And so we want to talk a little bit about that. We also want to talk about defining telemental health counseling and what that looks like for uh, the individuals who are trying to practice right now. We also want to look at some potential concerns for our clients and also for you as a clinician, some things you need to be concerned about. We want to talk about some software needs that are that will be very crucial for you as you're starting this practice. Also, some of the HIPAA fines that go along with not following the correct type of practice. And then some practical resources that will help you to get, to, get started in practicing online. Right now, one thing we are seeing is that the main thing that we are trying to do as therapists is we're trying to have uh, some way of the delivery of counseling services. That's what you've been trained to do. You've now found yourself in a situation, whether you're either in a practicum or, or, in, or some type of field experience, and you're needing to finish up your hours, but everyone is telling you you need to go online. Well, in order for that to happen, we have to start off and look at what are some of the conflicts we are seeing that are going on and how do we uh, navigate in these, these current conflicts that we have. And so what I want to talk about is the state laws that we have that, that are out there and how they are in conflict, conflict with the ethics that we hold. Also, we want to talk about the federal law and what the federal law says about uh, distance and delivery of services. Also, what our liability insurances are saying, and also third-party payers. Now, will affect some people, but not all people. But what they're saying when it comes to this whole process. So, we want to take each of these and see how they are currently at conflict with each other. So, uh, the first thing we want to look at is the state law. Uh, one thing that we're seeing uh, in, in several different states right now, the different states are, and their governors are making some proclamations that they're wanting people to go directly online to be able to provide telemental health counseling services. Universities are doing this, uh, and so that the states are saying this as well. And I think, uh, and I understand that the, the reasoning behind this, because you know, they, they want to make sure that people are able to finish their internships, be able to graduate. They also want people to, to be able to continue to get the services that they need to get. The problem with this is that as they are encouraging individuals to go online and to do online, the topic of training is not coming up whatsoever. And so some people are just basically jumping online doing like a one hour like training and then they think they're ready to go ahead and get started doing uh, telemental health counseling. And so this, even though our states are saying, hey, jump online and go ahead and get start practicing telemental health, there's some basic things that have to be covered and dealt with so that you know that you're prepared to do uh, telemental health counseling. And so the state law is that, that first piece of this conflict that we look at. The second thing we look at is just our ethics, is that when you look at the ACA code of ethics, and also you can look at the NASW, also look at the APA code of ethics, all of these code of ethics are saying the same thing, even the uh, AAMFT ethics, are basically telling us that when we practice something new, that we must show competence and remain in our scope of practice. And so anytime we're talking about uh, some type of practice we're doing when it comes to mental health, showing competence means that we've had training in that area. So if I'm doing EMDR, for example, in order for me to show competence, I need to go to trainings in EMDR in order to provide that services. If I'm doing parent-child interactive uh, uh, therapy, or if I'm doing brain spotting or several other different uh, specialized trainings that are out there, then ethically I'm bound to make sure that I'm showing competence by getting the training I need and we also stand in my scope of practice and our scope of practice comes from our ethics and also comes from the training that we get in our school so if I'm not getting the training at school 
And if I haven't gone to any type of training at all, then it really is not ethical for us to practice it in a certain way until we get that type of training done. And so if we look specifically at the ACA Code of Ethics when in, uh, in Section H, it talks a lot about telemental health counseling. And the first part of that, it tells us specifically that, that training is important and would for us to be able to show that we have confidence in this area. And so this is a, that second piece of that conflict that we have, that state law is saying, hey, you are able to do this, but we're ethically mandated to make sure we're showing confidence. So we're already seeing that there's a conflict that's, that is brewing, but it doesn't just stop with our ethics. It continues on into our federal law. Now, when we get to federal law, we also see a new conflict that comes up. First thing is that whenever we are doing telemental health counseling, one thing we have to be aware of is a, being able to use HIPAA secure software. That's one thing that we must uh, make sure that we're using anytime we're uh, working with someone who is um, our, our client. And so we look for software that is secure, but we, then we also must do it in a compliant manner. Now. With HIPAA comes along the other uh, federal law, which is called high tech. Both of these together are the guidelines that we should be using to make sure that we're practicing in the right way. That means that we use the right type of software whenever we are, we are connecting with clients. And it's important for us to make sure that we're using the, the, the right software. That way we are, we are competent in using that software and we're also protecting our clients protected health information. So th that becomes very important. But this, once again, is where we see the conflict. If state law is saying, hey, it's okay for you to jump online, uh, then now we're, and you can basically use whatever software you want to use, and the federal law and HIPAA is saying well, there are certain things that have to be used, we find this conflict that we are not following our ethics because we're going, well, we may be, we're not following our ethics, but we may be actually following the law. And so when those conflicts occur, we once again, we have to have to go through that ethical decision making model to figure out what is the right way to go about doing this. And so this federal laws that we have, they do come into play as we look at the, the conflict that we are going through. The next piece of this is looking at liability insurance. So while you're practicing right now and in, in, in this field experience, you do have some type of liability insurance. And just literally last week, I was received an email from my liability insurance uh, carrier. And the main thing they, they talked about was a crisis that we're going through. And what they, uh, the, the main thing they were saying was, we want to protect you. You're protected in doing telemental health counseling, but make sure you're working in your scope of practice. And so that scope of practice word comes up again, that we have to make sure that if, if we're going to practice online and practice within our scope, once again, training becomes something that becomes a, a crucial part of that. And so the problem, I, a really big problem I'm seeing is that a lot, we're, we're going to have a lot of people who want to jump online and do therapy. And then if any cases come up where they don't do things the right way, or whatever the case may be, they're not going to be covered by the liability insurance because, once again, they're not practicing within their scope. And so it's important to make sure that we are doing that and that we're practicing within, within our scope uh, when it comes to uh, doing online therapy or, to, or delivering these online services. And so telemental health is, is important for us to make sure that we try to do our best to deal with this conflict that's in, that's in place between the liability insurance and what the state law says, our ethics says, and also what federal law says as well. And also we want to talk about does um, the insurance reimburse for telemental health? And so for some of this, this may not be an issue with with whether or not we are uh, that they were taking third-party payments but for some people it will be an issue that uh, third-party payers if, if you're receiving funds already for the services that you are providing they may not reimburse or cover telemental health counseling or if they do they may only cover a certain type of counseling they may cover video but they may, may not cover phone or whatever the case may be and so once again we have to and what this does is this puts an uh, uh, puts an undue pressure on your client because now if the client is, doesn't know how to get to get these services paid for now this may come out of their pocket and they're having to pay for services that they weren't having to before because someone else was paying for them and they may not cover telemental health so this once again puts puts you in, into a uh, you into a bind and also puts your client into a bind and so for us once again to just jump into online therapy we have to realize when we look at state law when we look at the ethical code that we're bound to when we look at federal law with the HIPAA and high tech uh, laws that we have there, 
when we look at our liability insurance and also third party payments, we see that we have conflicts that are going on when it comes to us delivering these counseling services that we need to deliver. And so we wanna try to work through a way of getting through these conflicts so our clients are being taken care of. So when it comes to defining telehealth, it's a, it's a question that comes up all the time. When we define telehealth, it's basically an umbrella term where we are providing mental health services either through telephone, email, through some type of chat service, or through video. Now, uh, for, for the most part, uh, uh, I do a lot of training in, in talking to individuals about video-based therapy, but, uh, but the reality of it is you are able to do telephone-based services and email-based services and chat-based services. But in order to do all of these, you, once again, you need to know how to do these services. And so I don't just jump on my phone and start doing chat with, my, with someone or start email my client. I need to make sure I'm trained to do that in the right manner. And so even though we've been doing uh, counseling by phone for years with crisis hotlines and things like that, the official definition of, of telemental health includes phone now. And so when we, we, we talk about telemental health, this blanket term, we're looking at video, chat, email, and telephone services. And so we just want to consider that as we can, uh, uh, this definition as we can go throughout this presentation. So as we look at the uh, at telemental health, there are some potential client and clinician concerns we need to look at. And the first part of it is just the client and the clinician being comfortable with this modality. Uh, we have to make sure that as we are reaching out to clients that, and as we're talking to them, that they are actually comfortable with going in, into an online environment or using telemental health. Uh, if you look at the uh, ACA Code of Ethics, when it talks about specifically in Section H when it's dealing with uh, telemental health, one thing it talks about is that this has to be a choice for the client, that we can't just tell them, well, I have to do telemental health services with you. If the client is not comfortable doing telemental health, we can't force them into that modality. So it may be a thing where they, we may have to meet with them face to face because they are not wanting to do that. And so uh, in light of everything that's going on, some people say, well, that's not, that's not safe, that's not comfortable, that's not something I want to do. But at the same time, we have to look think about the, the clients that we're serving. And if the, the modality does not fit for them, then that's not a modality that we won't need to, need to force upon them in a, ethically. And also as a clinician, it may not be something that we're comfortable with doing either. Um, I've seen recently just on several different uh, groups and on social media where they, for, for therapists, where people are basically buying software to be able to do telemental health counseling. But then the next question they're saying is, how do I do it? So they're, they're ready, ready with the right software, but they have no idea what they're doing. So they're not comfortable at all. And so they're, they're basically practicing with their clients without any type of background in this area. So it's important for us to make sure that our clients are comfortable being able to use this modality, whether we're using video or phone or whatever the case may be, but we need to be comfortable with that as well. So that means we may need to practice a little bit before we start using this with real clients. Also, we have to ask the question, is the client appropriate for services? Uh, not every client is appropriate for telemental health services. And so we have to look at their history and see where they are. And this is, is this something that really is going to work out for them? And so with these clients, we want to see and, and, and look at, you know, do some type of screening with them. What's been their, their background and history when it comes to suicidal ideation or suicide attempts or homicidal ideation and attempts? And if, if that's been something that's been a... Uh, recurring issue for this client, then the question then becomes, is this client actually appropriate for services? And so, and there, so there may be some times where you you see a client and you've been working with them, you've got good rapport with them, but seeing them through telemental health just is not going to work. And you, you feel like that, that it's just going to be necessary for you to see them face to face in a traditional counseling environment. And so, uh, one of the, the, we just have to use some good judgment and once again use an ethical decision making model here on what is a, is this appropriate for is this client appropriate for the services. Another thing we also have to consider is having the right equipment. Uh, there are a lot of different things going on right now when it comes to having the right equipment. Um, you know, earbuds for example. I tell all my clients to make sure they're using earbuds during the session and gives them. Um, a sense of privacy so that uh, no one else can hear the, what only the, what the, the therapist is saying. 
and me as a therapist i also wear a pair of uh, earbuds as well to make sure that i'm keeping uh the, the the client's voice and i'm the only person that can hear that so that becomes a a, a big issue is making sure i have that um, also, I make sure that the microphone that I'm using works works well. Uh, so I make sure that it, it, it's, it's loud, it's clear. Same thing for the, my clients. Uh, I want to make sure that that works out well for them. And so we want to make sure on both ends we, we do have good microphones so that we can hear each other. Uh, another issue is just lighting in the room. You know, uh, whenever I'm doing a video session, I want to make sure that the lighting fr that, that's coming in needs to be behind the screen, behind my camera. Because anytime I have uh, 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 any, any type of, of light in front of my camera, it makes it very hard for me to see the client and, and it makes it hard for the client to see me. So it's almost like talking to somebody who's in, who's in a witness protection program. I really can't see who I'm, who I'm dealing with and talking to. So it becomes important for us to make sure that we uh, are, are the lighting and setup is, is done in the right place. Another thing we think about is the speed of internet service. Um, uh, even in 2020, one, something we're still seeing, there are a lot of people out there who will still have dial-up internet service. And so doing video-based services is, is just not viable when someone has a uh, dial-up service. And so we need to be cognizant of this, uh, the speed of their internet service that they have. And one thing that we're already seeing that even though someone one may have really fast internet service, one, one thing that's happening right now is that we have a lot of people who are online now who were not online just is even a one week to two weeks ago. We have schools that are out and so you have kids at home doing uh, work on the internet. You have more people like teachers who are online, teaching online who's not done that before. You have more uh, people video gaming and other things like that where they were using, well, when they were normally from eight to five, eight o'clock to five, eight o'clock in the morning to 5 p.m. They're normally out of the house. Now they're in the house, they're using more internet. And so because of that, this is gonna cause a drain on people's bandwidth. And so we're gonna see some bandwidth issues happening. And so because of that, it's gonna be important for you to make sure if you, at all possible that you are plugged, your, your computer is plugged directly into the uh, router whenever you are to providing services. Now I know that's, that's not possible for everybody. I, I think we, we've gotten to a point where we're very comfortable with using Wi-Fi for everything. But the reality of it is, is when using Wi-Fi for everything is not always a good thing to do because once we start using Wi-Fi, uh, our services do drop down. So uh, just as a suggestion, you know, if I'm using uh, uh, services of using Internet services, I, I would say at a minimum, you want to have at least a 25 megabyte download speed for your, your computer, for your Internet service that you're using uh, whenever you're trying to connect. I think anything less than that, I think you're going to have a very bad connection and this is going to be a very poor session that you're going to get into. So I'll say 25 megabyte is like the minimum download speed that you want to have uh, with, with your clients that you're working with. So uh, that speed of Internet service is going to be play a big factor in what you're doing. Another thing you're going to need to be thinking about is having a plan if the session is disconnected. That's going to be important. Um, if, if, uh, and right now, once again, but, uh, even with people who've been doing this for a long time, they're, they're starting to see that a lot of the services, video services that people have been traditionally used to using, they're super busy right now because so many people are online. And so if you end up getting dropped off your video call, what do you do next? And so being able to have a plan, are you going to call the client back first? Would the client call you back first? That's something you want to make sure that you have in place before you even begin that session. And so you, you may have to come up with a new informed consent to help you. So to help your clients to know what that looks like if that if you get into that type of situation. So you need to have that plan before your session even begins. Another thing we want to think about is the verification process for clients. The uh, when we look at uh, the NBCC and also the ACA uh, code, when it talks about uh, uh, providing uh, distance services and uh, online services, we need to be able to verify who the client is for the sessions. So, if someone walks into my office uh, uh, traditionally, you know, I'm getting their ID to see who they are, and so I need to still do that same process with my online client. And so whenever they come in for the first time, and, and even though I've had on ground session with them before, I want to make sure I'm checking their ID, that I'm seeing that, that the person that's on that ID is a person I'm supposed to be talking to. Also during that process, I want to come up with some type of code word that I'm, uh, that I'm working with with that client. 
And what that code word will do is will help me to be able to know that this is the person that I'm talking to. And so according to the NBCC, uh, their recommendations is that you do a client verification at every session. So let's just say that my um, code word uh, for my client or the client gives me the code word of coffee cup. And so at the beginning of every session, I'm going to ask them, what is the password that we're going to use? What the, what's the password have we established? And if they don't say coffee cup, then I'm then I'm not going to be able to continue that session. I want to make it with, um, that because they, they have failed verification. And so my thing is I, I try to help them to, to use a, a term that's very easy for them to remember. I'm going to use it at every single session so it becomes something that it becomes ingrained in them. They can remember that password easily. But that verification process for clients becomes extremely uh, important for them. So we, we want to make sure that it's done uh, for them. And we want to verify uh, uh, every session um, who they are. Also, as a part of this verification process, you want to verify where this client is at the time of the session. Uh, now, I realize that the majority of the people I'm talking to at this point are not licensed, but the rule of thumb that we basically are seeing is, is that wherever the client is at the time of the session and wherever you, you are at physically at the time of the session, you need to be licensed in that place. So obviously, if you're, not li if you're not licensed, the thing is you need to make sure you keep everything within the same state that you're in. And so this takes away the ability for us to be seeing people across state lines. There are some exceptions to that for people who are licensed already. But if you're not licensed, then the, the, the safest practice for you to do is to only see people who are in the same state that you are in. And that's going to be the, that's the, the best way to, to work through all of this. And so that verification process for clients um, is, is important. And, uh, at the time of service, know where they are and know who you're talking to. Also, finding a quiet space without any, any interruptions is going to be important, uh, especially when, with people having kids at home right now. Uh, finding a quiet space may be pretty difficult for them, but you want to uh, try to, to uh, provide that. For, hopefully, they can provide that. And also for you, you want to make sure you're in an environment where you're not getting interrupted during your counseling session. And so maybe it's a thing where you have your door locked during that time period, uh, and they do the same thing. But you do that as, as, a, as a precaution to, to, to guarantee the safety of the client's information. And that way, there's not any interruptions during that time period that you're working with the client. So, so a quiet space without interruptions becomes an important thing. So these are just a few of the potential client and clinician concerns that we want to look about and think about as we're thinking about telemental health counseling. Now, when it comes to software, we'll talk a little bit about some uh, some HIPAA secure video services that are out there. Uh, before I do that, I want to skip down to my last point. Before you begin doing any type of services online, you want to make sure that whatever video service you are using, that you get a signed business associate agreement with that uh, company you're using, that software you're using. What a business associate agreement basically is is this is any time you have uh, another entity outside of you and your client, this person has access to client information. And so by them signing this business associate agreement, they're basically saying they're not going to break confidentiality. So you want to make sure that you have a signed business associate agreement on file and keep it in a safe place. So with whatever company you decide to go to whenever you begin doing counseling services. And so if a, if a company is not willing to sign a business associate agreement with you, then I'm going to tell you to stay away from working with that company because uh, in the end, you, you are not protected if you don't have that business associate agreement. That, that, that's a part of being HIPAA compliant. That's not everything to do with HIPAA compliance, but that's a big piece of that. So here are a few different services that I want to talk to you about that are uh, some software that is that's either free or low price uh, that will, will help you to be able to uh, get online. Uh, one of the first ones uh, is called MyTrueCircle.com. Uh, this is a uh, video based service. They have uh, multiple different packages that you can uh, sign up for and you can, uh, you're able to connect with, uh, uh, with your clients uh, through their services. Uh, they have, to, uh, I think, about three different levels of services that you can use. Uh, I've used them before in the past and a very great company. Uh, and so uh, that's one I, I tell people about uh, that they, they can use. Uh, another company that, um, that, that does uh, 
that will work with you and also will we'll do the business associate agreement is vc.com uh, they've been doing uh, telemental health software for several years now uh, they will sign a business associate agreement with you and so you actually you might want to check in with them to see the services they offer um, one that is free that a lot of people are jumping on is called doxy.me um, and this is a free service and, and, and for a lot of people they, they jump to this one uh, but one of the things that we've just seen over the past few days is that um, not, this service has slowed down quite a bit and it's not any fault of their own but the demand for people to, to get online has, has overwhelmed them a little bit and so uh, when they would normally have you know, 2,500 people sign up in a month they're having about 2,500 people a day signing up and so that's putting you know, put some pressure on their servers and things of that nature and so I think you know you might want to try uh, that one out to see how that works uh, they have a free version and they have a paid version uh, both of those do come with a business associate agreement but it's, it's a software software that you want to use um, also zoom um, is a popular one uh, they do come with a business associate agreement now zoom is is a little bit higher price one uh, when, when you talk about on an individual basis uh, so uh, sometimes companies will provide a service for their, their client for their, uh, their interns or whatever the case may be but zoom has an excellent service that they use uh, it's one of the main ones that I use and uh, and, and it's interesting they have a they have a uh, agreement with my true circle so you're actually able to use some of zoom services through my true circle as well and so uh, they have a very good uh, qu high quality video uh, you're able to see multiple people on the screen at a time and so uh, that's another one I tell people to check out as well um, regroup connect is another service that, that will sign a business associate agreement with you they also have an agreement with zoom uh, to provide services and so that's another great one and also Google Hangouts, if you're paying for the G Suite package, uh, you're able to use them and they'll sign a business associate agreement with you. So it's, it's just important for you to realize there are, you have a lot of different choices out there to uh, use video based services. Um, and so uh, this, this so my, my suggestion to you is, is to look and see uh, and do, do some research, but these are some, some that I've had a lot of uh, connection with and have used before and uh, just want to kind of give you some, some options to look at when it comes to services that are out there. Now, let's talk about HIPAA penalties. And you might be wondering, why in the world are we talking about HIPAA penalties? Well, the re the reality of all this is is that, is that if, we, if we if we let's just say we break ethics or in, in this in this situation, you know, that's that 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 has to do with your license that you will eventually get or that you currently have right now. But when it comes to HIPAA penalties, this is where if our client's information gets into the wrong hands because we we're just not doing the right thing, that it can become very problematic. And so we want to make sure I want to kind of cover these penalties with you so you have an idea how serious this is so the tier one is what they call just a basic lack of knowledge and this is when someone breaks a HIPAA policy just for, just for having a lack of knowledge uh, the minimum penalty for that is hundred and nineteen dollars and the maximum goes up to almost sixty thousand dollars with a calendar cap of almost 1.7 million dollars and so we're talking about a lot of money here when it comes to breaking the uh, HIPAA for just a lack of knowledge and so that's why once again training becomes important uh, second thing is tier two is where there's reasonable cause, but not willful neglect. Uh, that just means that you you should have known better um, uh, to, to to do these to, to not do a certain act, but it was not willful neglect. The minimum penalty penalty is almost twelve hundred dollars for that. Uh, the maximum penalty is almost sixty thousand. With once again the, the calendar year cap being one point seven million dollars. Tier three is basically when you are just you just kind of let HIPAA go out the window. You just just willful willful neglect on your part, but you do correct it when within thirty days. The minimal penalty is eleven, almost twelve thousand dollars, and the maximum penalty is up to sixty thousand dollars. And once once again, when I, when I use these numbers, this is per occurrence. So if you're doing this multiple times, this is what that penalty is going to look like. And where the calendar year cap on that is one point seven million dollars. And then willful neglect is tier tier four. This is willful neglect where you've not corrected it within 30 days. The minimum penalty is, is sixty thousand dollars. Maximum penalty is one point seven million dollars. The calendar year cap of one point seven million dollars. So, if you haven't picked up anything at all from this this uh, this this uh, slide at all, 
it's important for us to make sure we're following what HIPAA says about keeping client information uh, secure. And so you know, you know, I would definitely check out HIPAA website to go and see what they what their all the requirements and things are. But this is just a kind of a quick overview to help you see that HIPAA is an extremely important thing for us to continue to follow. And obviously following our, our counseling ethics that we've been taught are important to follow uh, as well. So here are some some practical resources. So you know we, we we've gone through this uh, this this crash course. I've told you a little bit about the conflict that we have going on right now, and I've talked to you a little bit about some different ways that we can we can work around not work around work through this conflict we have. We talked about some of the considerations for the clients that would that would, that would come up, and also some considerations for the clinicians. And we've also looked at some some software you can use, and talked about the business associate agreement, and we looked at what HIPAA has to say as well. So here are just a few different things uh, that I would say uh, some some trainings I would suggest to you uh, as a student that there are a, a fairly low cost trainings that I would tell you to to, to use to get started. Uh, just just watching this video alone will not be enough to help you get started. I'm not my emphasis for you in this is for you to get some type of training to help yourself get started. Uh, one training I suggest is the one for renewed vision training. Uh, it's called telemen telemen sorry, Telemental Health Counseling 101. It covers the basics. It's a six-hour course uh, that, that's done there. Uh, and so that gives you, gives you enough basics to get yourself started in this practice. Uh, Zur Institute has a, another great training called Telemental Health Practical Applications. Uh, and once again, I think this is a six-hour training, and it will, it will be basic enough to get you started in, in, uh, in helping you to know what to do uh, and how to practice telemental health counseling. And also, person-centered tech. Uh, uh, Roy Huggins does. He uh, owns his website. He has a lot of different trainings on there. Some someone who I highly respect, uh, but, but he, has, he just he has, he has several different trainings on there as well. So. Here, these are just the three options uh, when, uh, for you to use to look at when it comes to some training. Now, once you're trained you, you, and you start getting practice, you want to get some support. So here's a free place to get support. Uh, it's called a Telemental Health Counselor Connection, it's, and it's a face group, Facebook group. Uh, there's roughly about 4,000 people in this group. These are people who have been practicing anywhere from a week up to about 10 years, uh, who've been, uh, people who've been doing telemental health counseling, and they can give you tips and tricks and stuff to, how, to help you to get better and to grow in this practice. And so I would definitely suggest get the training, to find one of these trainings, go there and get, get trained, at least at that six-hour mark. I think that's a, that's a very important part. And once you get that training done, then uh, no, maybe join this Facebook group to get some more free information on this. Well, I hope this uh, crash course has been helpful to you and uh, been able to open your eyes up to the world of telemental health counseling. Uh, we are in a position right now in our country that we've never been in before, but I think that we are setting ourselves up to, to learn a lot of great things and, and be able to learn some great skills that we did not know we even had. And so I hope that we will be, be able to learn from this situation and, and, and learn uh, some better, greater counseling skills because of this. And hopefully this has been something that will be helpful to you as you try to get started in telemental health counseling. Hope you all have a great day.